Well, it looks like we're in good shape to get started here. Um, I'm Dan Lohman. I'm the Senior Vice President and Director of GGNA's Survey Lab. Uh, our, what we do is all in the name. We conduct surveys uh, of all types for nonprofit organizations, primarily around advancement related issues. Uh, today, we're talking about about qualification surveys, using surveys in combination with other tools that you might use um, in order to identify new prospects. Now, this is uh, partially a pandemic issue because it provides an opportunity to uh, get some outreach while you're not necessarily able to go visit prospects. Um, and it's also a uh, long term, you know, outside of the context of a pandemic, we find it to be a very effective way to identify new prospects. So just some uh, um, housekeeping notes. Uh, I am not good at chewing gum and walking at the same time. So if you wanna submit questions, you can use the chat function within Zoom and I'll do my best to get to them and uh, I'll try to leave time at the end where I can respond to some questions as well. Um, all right, let me dive in. Um, so we're hearing from organizations all around the world, in fact, that they're struggling to identify and qualify new prospects. And as I mentioned, this is a constant need for organizations, but now more than ever when the challenges are heightened in, as I said, in terms of our ability to get out and do prospect identification and qualification surveys. Um, so some of the factors are we need tools for the remote work environment right now, and then we need better data to help identify constituents with both the capacity and the likelihood to give. Um, I should mention here, when we talk about other tools in beyond just surveys, things like wealth screening can be particularly valuable too. As we go through the presentation as it relates to surveys, is there are some obvious places where having uh, internal ratings or wealth screening ratings is a way to uh, qualify in a different way. I'll talk more about that as we get into this. Um, I, uh, Survey Lab is a, a um, unit of GGNA that we created back in 2016 in order to provide the highest quality surveys in the nonprofit space. Uh, and I, I feel confident that we have actually accomplished much of that. Um, surveys are the best kind of donor research. It's data directly from the source as opposed to modeling something or um, you know putting in some risk that maybe we're not talking to the right person. A survey, we send an invitation, maybe some reminders. Many people will fill out that survey and then we can use those results to help identify the group who might be the best prospects and then qualify from that pool. Um, the survey can act as a qualification mechanism in itself uh, that uh, without any other data, you've got a tool in which to identify potential prospects based on their stated interests in philanthropy and areas of interest within your organization. Um, plus, it's a great touch point. Just sending the survey is a form of stewardship, asking people for their opinion. So many of the communications that people receive from uh, nonprofit organizations are asking for money. And this is a way to say, we value your opinion and we want you to participate in this survey. So we find that surveys in general um, tend to produce not only useful data for prospect identification, but it makes donors happy that, the, that you've come out and asked them uh, as part of your planning. Uh, uh, how you're going to pull this pull this data in. Um, now I'm going to jump into a bunch of examples. Those of you who know me know that I can't do anything without a data chart. So I've got a few data charts here. Um, the um, three factors that you see here, positivity, loyalty, and connection, we view as extremely important uh, measures to help identify potential prospects. Um, so what you're looking at here, go on the far left side, positivity, you've got $10,000 plus donors, $1,000 to $10,000 and less than $1,000. And you can see on positivity, People are scoring pretty well. 87% um, you know, of the high level donors feel very positive toward the organization. 85% of the 1,000 to 10,000 feel that way. There's a little drop off in the less than $1,000 donors, but it isn't much. And um, um, if we jump to the loyalty portion of this, and I'll tie this together, I promise, 85% um, say that they feel very loyal, 81% of the mid-level donors feel that way, and then there's a more substantial drop to 65% for those at less than 1,000. 
So what's interesting about this to me is particularly if we look at the thousand dollar plus group, the two the two bars on the left side of each grouping here, um, a lot of if you don't feel positive or loyal, you're very unlikely to make a charitable gift of any significance to a particular organization. And um, it, it, the same uh, applies with loyalty. If you don't feel loyal, the odds are you're not going to make a charitable gift to an organization. But there are a lot of people who feel positive and loyal, yet don't go on to make gifts of any significance. So that's where connection comes in. On the far right hand side, the higher level donors, 61% say that they feel um, a, uh, a strong connection. That number drops to just 32% for the lower level donors. But now let's talk about this idea of a qualification survey. This summary data is great, but in a prospect qualification survey, it's not anonymous. Um, so the client organization in this situation would be able to see the names and the ID numbers and the contact information, et cetera, uh, for the constituents who answer these questions. So right off the bat, just by asking these three questions, we can start to identify who's positive, who's loyal, who has a, a feeling of, of connection. Uh, these are all very predictive of future, future giving. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, this question I really like. It's about perceived level of engagement. What I mean by perceived, this is what people say when asked um, how much engagement they'd like to have with the organization. And, um, and one of the things that we've discovered over the years is that when we build out engagement metrics and we start to count, you know, how many events did this person come to and uh, have they hosted things, uh, how has their giving been, um, we find that people's perceived engagement of uh, how much they, um, they want to be engaged or if they want to be more engaged is something that those uh, particular donors are coming right out and saying, I want to be more engaged. So it gives us a way that they're thinking that they want more engagement, even if the way that we've approached them in terms of measuring their engagement has, has either shown or not shown that they have uh, potential. So you can see in the top bar, the more engagement row, uh, almost 40% of the people who took this survey on the top bar said they want more engagement. So now if we look at positivity, loyalty, connection, and then we start looking at that people who say they want more engagement, we're starting to get a very interesting pool of people who are saying on a uh, consistent basis throughout a survey like this, um, that they share those emotional connections with an organization and they're telling us that they want more or less engagement. <clears throat> um, a question we often ask in these types of surveys are where does your organization rank among your charitable giving priorities? So if you know this is coming out from GGNA University, we can ask our is that university your first priority, your second priority, your third priority, and so on down the line. Um, in this instance, 50% of the people who took the survey said that um, that this organization is their first or second priority. Um, the which is a high number, but also if we start to think about um, the uh, the impact that knowing this uh, this set of information again come back to positivity, loyalty, and connection, add it to the engagement piece, and then start looking at the first second priority. Uh, our research shows that about eighty percent of dollars raised will come from people who rate the organization first or second in their list of charitable giving priorities. Uh, if you're third, if you're fourth, if you're fifth, it becomes much more difficult to raise more than annual fund gifts. Um, the you know meaning get gifts below a certain level. Um, and knowing who's first or second on their priority ranking and where you fit in their priority ranking is one more tool we now have to start to identify good prospects. Um, we can measure in part um, people's uh, philanthropic profile 
And what we're uh, what we're doing here is looking at the number of nonprofits that an individual supports in any given year. You can see most uh, uh, in this instance, most uh, of the donors that have been surveyed say they support at least three uh, institutions, and then another big chunk, almost half, say that they um, support at least six organizations. So this becomes important as we start to try to understand really how philanthropic this is. I, I don't think it's a presented to be a competitive situation of, of you know, we're, we're one of six organizations that this person is supporting. I think it's really a measure of their overall philanthropy and therefore it puts them in the category of potentially interesting prospects. And I have some questions coming in, so bear with me for just a second. Uh, will I be sharing the slides? Absolutely. We'll, we're going to send out an email in the next couple of days and you'll you'll receive that. Um, and a question about showing uh, a, a sample survey. I have a couple of examples of survey questions that are coming up. So thanks for those uh, uh, those for those questions. Um, we sometimes ask, do you give more? Do you give less? Do you give the same to the same charities? Will you give the same but shifting priorities forecasting for the year ahead? Um, the uh, Again, this is a measure of overall philanthropy. If somebody says that they give the same or they're planning to give more, all of that um, is useful information to have. Um, in part, uh, the answer to the question that I had about, will I show some samples of the survey itself? Um, so we uh, often ask a question about how connected do you feel? And you can see across the top, not connected, slightly connected, somewhat connected, connected and very connected. Um, this gets you know, into how we ask the question about connection, which we talked about at the beginning of the presentation. Now, this was a fun project because we did a couple of things. One is that we measured connection, feelings of engagement, um, you know, philanthropic priorities, is all, all things that we just talked about um, over the last couple of minutes here. But then we were trying to solve a problem that is um, certainly a serious issue in higher education, but uh, nevertheless is important uh, to other types of organizations. What we did here is we took, well, let me back up and say, problem we were running into was donors who or, or alumni who had a philosophy degree, for example, are probably not philosophers today. And people with psychology degrees are probably not psychologists these days. Um, so this um, was a way to start to look at how else an org how this organization could appeal to specific donors. So you can see in the example on the left hand side of the screen, uh, we, you know, we said animals interested or not interested, archaeology interested or not interested, there were 16 interest categories. If they they said interested, it blew up a little bit and asked for more details. So for example, in the, the cultural and fine arts section that we had, uh, um, it blew up to say, you know, dance, theater, um, uh, you know, music, uh, any of those kinds of things. And um, then, like I said, we can combine that with the other data about their potential interest in, and capacity. In this specific example, we were able to turn out 192 people who had graduated from colleges other than the College of Fine Arts at this particular institution and who were interested, who said that they were interested in theater. Uh, so that the fine arts gift officer was pretty happy with that result. They basically got the equivalent of two portfolios of potential names of people who said they were interested in theater, uh, who said they were very connected, very positive, very loyal. Uh, and that then turned into this, this really strong list of people who've raised their hand and said, I'm interested in uh, uh, being more engaged. Um, another example from a survey itself, um, imagine you were considering making a major gift to the university in the future, how likely would you be to direct it to the following purposes? Um, so this is a slight variation on the previous slide. Um, and I'll tell you that um, in nine surveys out of 10 that I see, scholarships, research, and capital infrastructure always rate the highest, no matter how many other categories we put in here. Um, but 
some people uh, inevitably want to support things other than scholarships, undergraduate and graduate research and uh, infrastructure and capital projects. But so this gives you a tool to start to drill into maybe some of the categories that are struggling uh, with their uh, in their fundraising efforts because they just don't have the resources to do the qualification work that they need. Um, so everything we've talked about so far is kind of how we gather the data. And, you know, we ask these questions, we ask people to prioritize, we pull in these different factors and components. Um, and um, the next thing that we'll typically do in a project like this is a scoring model. Um, it's frankly not particularly sophisticated that we take the results of the survey and we apply a point ranking. So if somebody says they're very connected, they get 10 points. If somebody says they're not connected, they don't get any points. And that runs through the whole survey in terms of our ability to um, uh, uh, apply this score. Uh, and you can see some examples here on the top uh, in the top chart. Um, there's 164 and 97, there's about 250, uh, uh, 350 names that uh, pop out as having high scores, that this particular score kind of topped out around 130 possible points, and we're seeing 47 people who landed there. Um, and then you can see in the lower chart how this kind of fits with actual giving that uh, a pretty high percentage of donors of $1,000 or more had high scores and donors less than 500 had considerably lower scores, the 7.3 plus the 2.2 scoring very high. And then the numbers go up as we start to um, move through the dollar values up to the $1,000 uh, uh, dollar range. Um, when my colleague, Royal Rarick, pulled this slide. Um, I went running around showing it to everybody who would listen to me that it came out as a bell curve, that it's maybe it's more of a witch's hat, but it's definitely in the bell curve general sense. Um, and this is, it was a much larger survey. It had about 14,000 respondents. And we scored the survey. It was the top number was 350. Uh, 300 even. And what I'm highlighting is everybody who got a score between about 275, there's one outlier that's out of the 300, um, all the way up to the 200s. And that got us about 10% of the total population that was in here. And that's the population, right? That they've answered the question so consistently in a positive sense that this represents an opportunity to try to get them to raise their hand. And now uh, some clients stop at this point and say, okay, we've got our list. We know the background. Uh, we can focus on that. Others want to take it to a next step, which is, uh, would you be open to meeting or talking with someone from the institution to provide feedback on philanthropy and engagement opportunities? People say yes. Um, now it's there's sometimes I get some concern from the organization that this is too bold of a question and some organizations maybe it is and we can ask a question in a slightly different way that maybe feels a little softer rather than this kind of hard ask. Um, but I, I, I do want to emphasize that very few people say no or we don't even offer no we just say maybe at a later time which sort of smooth things out. Um, and hang on, let me answer some questions here before I get to the, the bottom part of this slide. Um, we have a question, that, uh, do you have a way to unpack what more engagement means? Does the prospect know what they're saying when they say they want more engagement? We can be specific and we have um, saying, you know, what are the areas in which you might want to be specific. We can also add questions that are very specific to your organization, kind of like that, um, that, that blow up that we did of the what areas are you interested in. We can add, in fact, we often add what are some of the ways that you would like to engage with the institution and that can range from, you know, just reading the institutional magazine all the way up through I want to volunteer I want to be a big donor I want to be I, I, I want all these other factors. Um, 
I have another question. What do you find to be a typical response rate to these surveys? It tends to be around 13 to 16 or 17 percent. There's a lot of variation. I have some clients that have produced, you know, 44, 45 percent participation, um, and you know that's a very effective approach um, uh, in that regard. Most though are not that high. Most though are at, at that other level. Now keep in mind with a qualification survey, it's probably not a one off that you send it to a population, uh, get the results back, and then anyone who didn't respond to the survey, we can wait a couple of months and send out a new invitation. And that can often produce pretty significant bumps um, as people are kind of reminded that there was a survey in their inbox. Um, you know, we, we all do that too. When you get an email from the United Airlines asking you how your flight was, we don't always answer that that survey. And, and, and in fact, we only answer that survey when something bad happened nine times out of ten. Um, uh, sorry, I have a couple of different questions here, some of which I'll, I'll be able to respond to. Um, if it's the question was similar to some of those, I'm getting a lot of questions about um, uh, expectations around response rate. So I think I feel I've answered that question, but if not, let's be in touch. Um, next question, and then I'll get back to the, um, the presentation. Will you be sharing a recording of this? Absolutely. So we will share both the slides and a recording. You'll receive an email from GGNA um, uh, probably tomorrow. Okay, let me get back. One um, very useful um, factors among uh, components of a survey like this is to ask about inclusion in a will or estate plan. Um, so, you know, have you included the institution in your will or estate plan is really the question here. Um, and then you can see here that there's a bunch of people who said yes. Um, it's not a huge number, but it is a number that's not small. And this is important because you probably don't know all of these people, people who've put you in their will or estate plan, but never necessarily told you that they've done that. So this is a quick and easy way. People who said, yes, let's compare that to the list of people that we already know have planned gifts that were, were designated as a recipient. Um, so inevitably there's a few that you don't know. And if plan giving can reach out to those folks and develop a dialogue, you may um, pay for a survey like this um, in, in the first few days because some number of uh, planned gifts will come out, will come out of that, you'll be able to document them. Um, the, I, I um, don't like no necessarily um, because they're, they're big numbers and they're, you know, the, they don't necessarily get us anywhere. But if we can say, yes, I plan to, or I'm undecided at this time, we, we wind up with a, a good set of results. Um, let's do some more questions. Um, do you have techniques for identifying and selecting the populations, donors versus non-donors, recent donors? Um, yeah, so we'll get a data file from the organization in, in our case. This, by the way, this is not an advertisement. I'm just used to coming at it from what I know is the data. That you, this is something you can do yourself and there's other companies that do it. Um, uh, so just keep that in mind. Um, the, um, the, in our experience, we will divide the results into donors versus non-donors, recent donors. There's a million ways we can cut it. And like I said, it's not anonymous. So when you get the results back, we can work with you to identify and do reporting on GIF. You, I've used a lot of examples that have shown by GIF level. We can do young alumni versus older alumni. We can do geography if you're, um, you know, heavily, if, especially outside of higher ed, if you're arts and culture, um, uh, independent schools, sometimes your population is relatively uh, geographically uh, compact. So that kind of geography of are you in that area, are you out of that area? Um, I got a great question here about using um, qualification surveys on the telephone. And I think if you 
Well, there's a couple things. You ha if you're working from a script, that's great. And we can answer some of these, these questions simply by saying we're conducting a survey of our donors. Would you be interested in these things? Um, you probably get a higher response rate, honestly, um, that people are using their phone and Zoom at a, at a vastly higher rate. And we're finding donors are responding to that, that um, you know, the, the organizations that have pressed forward with their fundraising in new ways uh, are doing pretty well and the organizations that have stopped fundraising in their traditional ways are the ones who are struggling the most um, out of what's sometimes a, a misguided effort to um, you know not quote unquote irritate prospective donors our experience is that they're not getting irritated they want to be engaged and that's where a, a survey or a phone survey could come in um, are respondents asked to give their name or do they have a unique link so you know who responded? They, if we were doing it, it would be a unique link. So uh, we're honest in the invitation and on the first page of the survey that this is not anonymous. Um, we, it's a confidential survey, meaning we're not going to use the information outside of the organization. Um, but uh, um, that's a good question. And by using their unique link, we can link that back to your ID number in your database so that we can pull in any data we might want to look at, like past giving, like relationship type, you know, any of those kinds of things. A um, couple more questions. Um, how might you frame the entire survey to donors in your introductory email or invitation? Um, if I'm understanding correctly, um, the invitation is uh, usually comes from somebody at the inst the, the name, the from name will come from somebody in the institution who maybe has a more recognizable name, whether that's the chief development officer or the president, or um, can be that the head of advancement or development. Um, and you know that message then says we're conducting a survey uh, for our strategic planning, something like that. So it's it's honest, but doesn't necessarily get to that. The last question is going to be raise your hand if you want to talk about a major gift. Um, I think the last question that we're going to have time for is uh, how does an organization gauge when to send a survey? We have inundated our constituents with updates about COVID, school remote, remote learning appeals to annual fund. Um, there's never a great time to do a survey and there's also never a bad time to do a survey except right around Christmas. Um, but we find that even Thanksgiving, we tend to get responses right before, right after. Um, it's, it's not such a big issue. Um, one way that you might resolve this is look for some gap, maybe it's just a week where you don't have information going out or get on the calendar to send the survey out during that period of time. Um, um, the I hope that answers the question. I think that if you can find that gap or create a gap for you to send out the survey, um, you know, you may not get as many responses, uh, but you should still get a healthy number of responses. What's important about this type of survey is actually not what the response rate is, because we're looking for each individual that responds to the survey to see if they might be a better prospect. So if we only get 10 responses, we still have 10 names that we can review and look at. If we get a thousand, obviously that that's um, you know in a, puts us in a great position, um, but uh, is not um, uh, where was I headed with that? Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna chalk that one up to getting old and not remembering how to close that thought. Uh, let me just check and see if we have any more questions. Um, what's your best subject line and open rate for doing these surveys? Um, it's usually along the lines of, of um, you know, please, uh, you know, a, a, a survey, um, we, we need your help or we're looking for information. Um, please give us your feedback is a common one that we use. Again, it's honest, but may get uh, some open rates. And we do reminders. So the um, number of uh, people who take the survey initially will get different reminders that have slightly different language. Uh, last question, in this type of survey, would you also ask questions regarding awareness of the organization programming, other communications, et cetera? Absolutely. 
um, that it, there's if we especially if we want to make this a more broad based survey to understand sort of themes throughout your constituent population and um, um, the uh, our ability to put in questions about how do you want to participate, uh, how do you want to engage, what do you think of our communications, where do you get most of your information, very, very interesting stuff, and in fact, interesting enough that sometimes we do surveys strictly on that, that subject. Well, we are right at 1230 um, at time, which makes me feel happy because I planned this one well, um, and uh, I think we're going to, um, we're going to uh, shut it down. The uh, as a number of people have asked, we will make the recording available as well as the slides, and you should be getting an email in the next couple of days at most uh, to, uh, to to get this information. I'm always happy to answer questions. Um, my contact information is Dan at uh, Dan Loman. Ah, I'm really getting this wrong. D Loman. Um, at uh, Grenzglier, G R E N Z G L I E R dot com, uh, and that that information will also be in the email that uh, you get with the other uh, with the download and the recording. Uh, well, thank you very much for joining us over um, lunch in parts of the country and dinner in other parts of the world. Uh, this has been uh, fun for me to do, and uh, like I said, if you've got questions, I'm more than happy to try to answer them.